Jesus has been in the Garden of Gethsemane and what has just transpired, where we left off last week. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus is there. They've showed up with a thousand soldiers, a cohort of soldiers is what they tell us. And if those of you who have been to Jerusalem and to that area and seen the Garden of Gethsemane, it is difficult to get a thousand people on that plot of land, plus the officials of the Sanhedrin that have gone out to help arrest Jesus. And as you remember, uh, when they asked, uh, Jesus comes, says, Who are you seeking? And they say, We are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. The officials right in the front step back, and it just causes a domino effect because the scripture says they all fell to the ground. It's boom, 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 boom. I imagine there was enough people circling around there that it was, um, uh, it was quite a sight to see. A second time, Jesus says, uh, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I told you, I am he. Now, what I want you to do before you take me is I want you to let my 11 apostles go free. They have nothing to do with this. Just take me. Uh, to that, Peter decides uh, he's going to defend the Lord. Remember, he has said, I'm going to defend you to the death. And Jesus says, no, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Well, Jesus, uh, Peter picks up one of those swords. Remember, back in the upper room, Jesus had said to them, uh, go and take and, and sell something because we're going to need a sword. We're going to need to protect ourselves and we're going to need a sword. Well, they look around. They don't go buy anything. They say, Jesus, Jesus, we've got two swords here in the room with us. You don't think about that. You don't think about the apostles carrying swords. Well, they didn't have sawed-off shotguns. What do you think they were going to have? They didn't have pistols. Flintlocks were not in, in, even invented yet. They fought with swords and clubs and axes and, and shields, and, and, and that's what they did. Well, they take the swords with them when they left. They left the upper room, and they left it clean, and they headed off. So amongst the apostles, there was two swords. Peter gets one of them, and he goes, and he's going to split the head of the uh, slave of one of the, of one of the priests. His name was Malchus. Well, he misses his head, hits his ear, his ear falls to the ground. There in front of everybody, Jesus tells Peter, put your sword away. He reaches down and he picks up the ear of Malchus and he reattaches it. I wonder if there was a scar. I bet there wasn't. Yeah. Jesus got rid of all the proof that it happened. So they couldn't convict Peter of doing something because the ear was back on. Well, lo and behold, they take... Um, Jesus, and they bind his hands, and the soldiers take him away to, and this is where I left you off last week in the middle of the sentence, because it was a great transition point. Usually I never dare do that, but I did it this, this time. They take him off to Annas, who is at the Sanhedrin place uh, where they meet. Annas is the previous high priest. Now, if you remember in front of our, some of our other lessons, the high priest was not elected by the Sanhedrin. Uh, you probably would have thought it had been. I mean, if we'd wanted somebody in here to be our high priest, we'd have taken a vote amongst ourselves, and we'd have selected somebody to be the high priest, the high potentate of the Sanhedrin, if you want to call it that. Uh, but by this time, that was not happening. <clears throat> the Roman government chose the high priest. And if you remember Gratius, Pontius Gratius, the procurator of the area was endowed by Caesar to select the high priest because the high priest had to be under the thumb of Caesar, the Roman government. Well, Gratius had put, an, had put Annas in as high priest previously. Pontius Pilate had come in and he had put Caiaphas in as high priest this year. Caiaphas had only been in for the year. Caiaphas, I mean, uh, Caiaphas is the son-in-law of Annas. Now, Annas is going to have a very wonderful privilege. Many of his true biological sons will have the privilege of serving as high priest in their lifetime. In fact, Annas himself will again come back and be put in the position of high priest later on, several years later. Right now, it's Caiaphas. Uh, Caiaphas is probably still home in bed. He may be... Um, he may be in the Sanhedrin uh, in the area, uh, but, but the first place they take Jesus to is they take him to Annas there at the Sanhedrin where they meet. That's where we pick up. And they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. 
Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of all the people. And John tells us about that back in John chapter 11, verse 50. Uh, Caiaphas is scared to death of this movement that is following the Lord. And he has said, he has said it is expedient, it is important, it is mandatory that Jesus die. The leader of this clan must die. If he does not die, what he is saying to the folks, to the Sanhedrin, then the world as we know it, the religion as we know it, is going to turn upside down. Caiaphas himself is not elected by religious leaders. He's there by order of Caesar through the proculate, who is, uh, at this point in time, Pilate. So he understands that changes are happening. But he thinks that if by any chance whatsoever Jesus is allowed to live, it will destroy Judaism it will destroy the Sanhedrin and the power that they have over the people. Little does Caiaphas understand that what he is saying is fixing to come true. It is expedient for one man to die for the nation. It is. But, it's, but the way we take it, that it was important for Jesus to die, is not the way Caiaphas was saying it. Caiaphas wanted him to die so that the movement would die. Well, we'll look on verse uh, 15. Simon Peter was following with Jesus. And so was another disciple. Now, most of us have lived all of our lives studying the Bible, uh, seeing um, pageants uh, about the death of Christ, and we have failed to see what is in this passage. It's very interesting. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Huh. I wonder who that disciple was. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest. Hmm. Huh and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. So when they took Anna, uh, Jesus from Annas and took him over to Caiaphas, and took, oh, sorry, took him into Annas, not only did Jesus go in before Annas, but another one of Jesus' disciples went in there also. It was a disciple that Annas and the other priest knew was a disciple of Jesus. They knew this man goes on to say, But Peter was standing at the, at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Catch what happens. Jesus has been taken from the Garden of Gethsemane back across, across the Kidron Valley, back over to this place. That is a Sabbath day's journey, not in this passage, but we find it out in a different passage. That is a Sabbath day's journey that they have traveled with Jesus. They bring him in, and one of the disciples goes in with Jesus and then sees that Peter is outside, goes to the doorkeeper and says, we want to let him come in. The doorkeeper then goes to Peter and says to him, look what it says, Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. It's the first denial. It is an outright lie. Who is that disciple? Well, John tells us in John 21, uh, verse 24, exactly who this disciple is. Because in John 21, verse 24, and it's not in your lesson, you just have to trust me, we'll get there next week. He says, I am the one who saw all these things and testify to you that these things are true. That young disciple who went into Annas' place with him was and had to be John, the author of this letter, the youngest of the twelve apostles. He goes in with him. He invites Peter to come, gets the door slave girl to go invite Peter to come in. That's interesting. Look also. Matthew, look at when I say who all records this. Uh, we see in all three of these passages on this page, Matthew records it, Mark records it, but Mark is not an eyewitness. But Mark records for us and write, writes down the eyewitness account of Peter. Luke is there. Luke is not there because Luke is not a believer at this point in time. But Luke writes down for us in his gospel the eyewitness account of Paul. Remember, Paul is a, is a Pharisee. 
He's in these meetings. He's watching what's going on. He's part of this. He's going to become the great persecutor. So Paul is in this meeting. That's the way that Luke is going to get the information from the eyewitness account of Paul. And of course, John is there. John is the younger. So we've got these eyewitnesses. Look, the Gospels are a record of the eyewitness accounts of men. If it's not an eyewitness account, it's not in Matthew. If it's not an eyewitness account, it's not in Mark because Peter didn't see it. If it's not an eyewitness account, it's not in Luke because Paul didn't see it. If it's not in John, it's because John didn't see it. John saw this, and he records what happens there. So this slave girl has just done the normal thing. She's just gone up to Peter just because she's the doorkeeper, says, Hey, Peter, uh, Simon, are you one of these guys? If you are, that you want to go in to be with your master and with the disciple, with John, who's just told me to let you in? And Peter goes, I'm not one of them. First denial. First big fat lie. Oh, I shouldn't say big fat lie. Well, anyway, it's a big fat lie. This is what it is. He's just lied. Matthew hears it. Peter hears it. I'm sure Saul heard it because they were doing it from the doorkeeper, from the door. I mean, they didn't have swinging doors and stuff like. I mean, it was just wide open. Uh, they weren't worried about letting the air conditioner out because they hadn't invented it yet. As John hears it. John's the one that wanted him in. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. You know, in all the pageants that we've seen, we never think about it being a cold night. That's never portrayed to us, that they're warming themselves by the fire because it's a cold night. When they beat Jesus and they strip him down, it's a cold night. Peter is over there warming himself by the fire because it's a cold night. It's still early spring. It's not in the midst of the summertime like we get in our minds, the pictures where they hang Jesus on the cross and sweat coming down his brow. This is, this is the early spring. It is not hot, hot, hot. And besides that... Um, it's a, little, it's a little higher than we are. We, we, you always think about Jesus being in the same uh, uh, climate as you are. You know, I guess if you're in Alaska, you think about having snow most of the time. But and here in Houston, we think about it being humid. And all, and, uh, you know, Israel's up about the level of Dallas, about 300 miles north of us. So it's a little higher up. Uh, even though it can get very hot there, it, it, it's still spring, so it's not too hot. So the doorkeeper is just ask a normal question. And Peter's denied it. And then there's the slaves that are standing around and the officers, the guys who have just gone to get Jesus and brought him over. They're standing around the fire too. Now, just look at what has happened. It's the, it's the ones who got him. They saw him cut off the ear of the slave. You understand this? They saw it put back on by Jesus. I'm sure they were dumbfounded and they're all warming themselves by the fire. Doesn't make sense to me. But it's the way it happened. See, they didn't, the slave was okay. They didn't have to arrest him because he was healed. You follow him? So there was no charges against him. So that not one of them would have been lost according to the word of the prophecy except for the son of perdition, which was Judas who had already gone away. In fact, Jesus had already said that twice to us. So Peter is standing there. He is warming himself. We pick up at verse 19. It says, Now the high priest then questioned Jesus. And that's the former high priest, all right? That's Annas. Question Jesus about his disciples. He's not questioning Jesus about Jesus and about whether he's the Son of God. He's questioning Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. So he's questioning Jesus about his disciples, questioning Jesus about his teachings. And Jesus turns to him and says to him something very interesting. He says, I have spoken openly to the world. Jesus has not gathered in the corner of a world to tell somebody something, his disciples, that he's not willing to tell everybody else. If the high priest would have showed up in the, in the upper room, Jesus would have told the same thing he told to them in the upper room with the high priest there. Jesus did every single thing he did, everything he wanted to say. He said it in view of everybody. In fact, he's already told us those who have eyes to see and ears to hear will understand and will see what's going on. But if they don't, have that understanding and the eyes to see, they will not see. It'll be just gobbledygook to them. That's my word, gobbledygook, not Jesus. But since he invented I guess it's a good word. So Jesus says, I didn't do this. 
In fact, what Jesus is really saying to them, why are you asking me these questions right now? Why didn't you ask me these questions back on Tuesday when I was in the temple all day long from early, early until late, late teaching? Why didn't you ask me that question, those questions on Tuesday? Why didn't you ask me these questions on Monday when I was there in the temple all day long? He's taught in the synagogues. He's taught in the temples. He's whatever. Everybody's been watching him. The, the priests and everything have been watching him. But they, he has never said anything back in a back corner. Now, let's just make an application here because Jesus teaches about the sin of doing this stuff in the back corner. And he also teaches, uh, Paul teaches about it too. Uh, picks up on the same thing. Let's say that a group of you, and I'm going to make this just kind of wild and out there, don't like the way the sound system sounds in this room. Doesn't have enough bass in the sound system for your way of hearing. So about five of you gather over in this side room over here after class, and y'all get you don't know how you get to talking. You you hear how bad that is? That, that sound system needs some bass in it. That, that sound system needs some bass, and it's, just, it's a tragedy for us to have to go in and not, not listen to the sound system that's got enough bass down in it. They need to fix it. You know, if that system doesn't work, we need to spend some money to fix that sound system to make that bass sound good. So when Jim teaches to us, it sounds good. Well, nothing gets done the next week, and lo and behold, now you've got a dozen of over in this, this, this corner room. You've got the door shut, and you're getting at it, and you're stirring up strife amongst the people. Lo and behold, you come back the next week, it's not satisfied. Then the next week, it's still not satisfied. And you end up going to Chuck Snyder or to John Morgan and saying, we've got to have a new sound system. You're stirring up a mess. When all you had to do was just come out to me and say, hey, Jim, is there anything we can do about getting the sound system fixed? You're trying to take it on your own to get the base. And I, and I would say, hey, you know, yeah, let's see what we can do. We'll see what we can work out. If we can, I'll come back and tell you. If this is the best we've got, we may have to raise some money to do something. But you're stirring up a mess thinking the church ought to pay for the sound system. Not thinking that you're the church. You realize what we do? Something's not right with the carpet or the piano. Right? So you get over in a corner and you stir up a little strife, a little group. Jesus teaches not to do that. Jesus never did that. If you can't make your questions out in the open just when people are there... You shouldn't do it in the corner of a room like the Sanhedrin did. In the middle of the night, they would gather, gather in secret to see what they could do about this Jesus. What they could do about the bass in his voice on his sound system when he plays. See how absurd that, absurd that is? It's the same way. Don't ever be a part of a small group. I teach my Madison that if she's ever sitting around, because this is what I do, and somebody sounds like they're saying something about gossip, just say, whoops, well, it's time for me to go to the bathroom. i got to go and get up and leave. Uh, whenever, whenever one of our relatives starts saying something bad uh, and we're at the dinner table, and in fact, we do it when, even when we're out eating, somebody starts saying something bad about one of our other um, relatives, I'll say, whoops, you know, we forgot about that other meeting we got to go to back at the house. Let's get our ticket and we leave. And we'll leave our food half, uh, half uneaten. We're not going to be a part of a group that's going to talk ungodly about anybody, not one person. I don't care whether they're right or whether they're wrong. We're not going to be a part of a group in the corner of a room. The Sanhedrin and the priests, that's the way they did. Back room deals here and there everywhere. And folks, we got that problem all around us. Back room deals going on everywhere. Well, that's not part of the scripture, but we'll go on here. Jesus answered him and said, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I have spoke nothing in secret. Be like Jesus, folks. Don't speak things in secret. Oh, it's one of my pet peeves. 21. Why do they question me? Question those who heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. Jesus said, everybody knows. Talk to some of your own folks, in other words. Some of your own Sanhedrin, some of your own priests. They've heard what I've said. Ask them what I've said. They can tell you what I've said. Truth is truth is truth is truth. <laughs> so when he said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? That, cho that changed the total focus of Jesus' words. Jesus then turns to the officer who has just struck him. He's been talking to Annas, the high priest. Now he is talking to the officer who just struck him. Jesus answered him, 
If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Well, Anna sees he is not going to be able to do anything with Jesus. So he sends him bound on to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, the high priest. So, John alone gives an account of what happens here because remember, Peter got invited to come in, but Peter didn't come in. That's the reason why Mark doesn't have this, ta- this bit in the book of Mark because Peter didn't see it and didn't hear what transpired. Only John did. All right? John chapter 18, verse 25, where we pick up, now Simon Peter was standing and still warming himself by the fire. Matthew is evidently somewhere around because he hears it. Peter is there because he's the one it's happening to. Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, that's who Luke wrote the eyewitness of. So uh, Luke's account has it. And of course, John evidently goes outside, follows Jesus as they're going to take him away. And here's what happens. So they said to him, you're not one of the disciples, are you? You got this. We're all warming ourselves by the fire. The doorkeeper said, hey, are you one of the disciples? You want to come on in? No, I don't know him. Here we are. We're, we're toasting marshmallows by the fire and warming ourselves. Got it? So you got any Hershey's chocolate to go on this marshmallow? How about anybody got graham crackers? They're just having a time. They're just warming themselves. Just staying warm because it's a cold night. Aren't, aren't you one of the disciples with Jesus who they're just taking off right there? And Jesus says, I mean, Peter says, no, I, I'm not one of them. Second lie, big, fat lie. And they hear it. Aren't you glad that you can lie sometimes, even intentionally, and God will still use you in the long run? You realize that? Peter, the little chip off the rock that is going to be the foundational person that preaches the big first message about the Savior to start off the church, so 3,000 men coming to the church on that day... He's the same guy that's going to lie three times within a three-hour period. Actually, less than that. You got it? Can you believe? It's so good that we can really mess up in our lives and get right with God and still be used. If you don't get anything else out of today, get that. No matter what you've done in your past, you can still get right with God and God will still use you. He'll use you beyond measure if you'll get right with God. Now, the important part is, is you just don't say I'm right with God, but you really get right with God. You understand? And that's, there's a big difference between the two. You really have to give it up and give it to God and allow God to push you and move you in the directions of the path that He wants you to go, the plans that He has. But we are so stubborn in our ways, you know. A lot of us have our own personal opinions, and we think our personal opinion is the right opinion. I'm not going to have you raise your hands on that. Because I'd hate for some of you to keep your head hand down and therefore lie before God. Because we do. We all have our opinions and we all think what we think is right. And Peter had a time when he thought what he was doing was right, but it was wrong. Hmm. So look here. So John alone gives us that account of that. Um, and I'm sorry, Peter, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John gives that account. And then one of the slaves of the high priest comes up to Peter. I'm sure he's coming up to warm himself too. And he's a relative of the one whose ear was cut off. (laughs) He's blood with, uh, with Malchus, the slave whose ear was cut off. Did I not see you over in the garden with him? Sure he did. You can't get out of that one. And Peter says, no, I'm not it. And immediately the rooster crows. By this time in, in, in Jerusalem, they were going by the Roman uh, uh, time clock. And uh, they would have four watches of the night. One started at 6 o'clock p.m. with twilight <clears throat> and went to 9 o'clock. The second watch was from 9 o'clock to 12 The third watch was from 12 to 3. The fourth watch was from 3 to 6. Those were the night watches. Then you would have the day watches from 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6, and then it'd start back over. 
Now, in Jewish time clock, on the Jewish timing system, the, the, the um, uh, time from 12 to 3, there was a trumpet, a ram's horn that was sounded. They call it the rooster crow, but it was really a ram's horn that sounded at midnight to tell you it was time for the midnight to 3 clock. Then at 3 o'clock was the second rooster crow. It was actually a ram's horn. It was not a rooster. It was a ram's horn. That type of thing. That's pretty good. I might put that in my repertoire and use that quite often. Um, uh, that was called the second one. So from 3 to 6 is the second rooster crow. Now, it's after midnight when they take Jesus to Caiaphas. Get to Caiaphas. So... He, all this has to happen before the second rooster crow because the next one's not called a rooster crow. The next one is called morning. You got it? Because it's, it's the daylight time. It starts at 6 o'clock. So from 3 to 6 is the second rooster crow. Uh, and, and at 6 o'clock, you start the daylight time shift. So it, this is the one. Mark over in his uh, uh, gospel tells us that, the, that this happens before the second rooster crow because he's telling them in the time frame and the way they, the, that the Romans would think about this. And so John's telling us different. Anyway, Peter is going to deny three times and that rooster's going to crow. So that's what happens. And John records that for us. But John does not tell us about the guards beating Jesus or the false witnesses testifying against Jesus when he's with Caiaphas. He doesn't tell us about Caiaphas condemning Jesus and sending him to Pilate. He doesn't tell us that. And he also doesn't tell us about how the Sanhedrin just beats the snot. I shouldn't use the word snot, should I? But you know what I'm talking about. Just beats the snot out of Jesus before they send him to Pilate. They were ungodly with Jesus. They cannot condemn him to death. They cannot put a judgment on him, though they try, because that's been taken away from them by Caesar. They cannot do that. They do not have the power to put anyone to death, but, and they cannot, should not ever beat him, because Jesus is a Roman citizen. He was born in Israel when Israel was controlled by Julius Caesar. I'm sorry, Augustus Caesar. Mm -hmm. Sorry, wrong. Anybody born from the time of Julius Caesar was born under his control, was considered a Roman citizen. So Jesus is born in the time of Augustus Caesar. So he's a Roman citizen, just like Paul was a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen could not be beat unless he had a judgment on his head. He could not be put to death unless he had a judgment given to him. And by the way, in their legal system, you would be put before the jury or the judge on one day to say what you're guilty of and find that to be true or false. And if you found that to be true, you had to wait for another day to have your condemnation of what was going to happen to you put on you. So you could not have a, you could get a verdict on one day, but then your penalty and punishment would have to come on another day. I think it's a pretty good idea if you ask me. So, and that was because they didn't want the emotions of the crowd to run into a penalty that wasn't set worthy of the crime. Well, John is the only one that tells us then about Jesus being over with Caiaphas. So Jesus is taken over there. I mean, taken from Caius to the Praetorium. And John is the only one that tells us what happens here at the Praetorium. So it says, Then they led Jesus from Caius to the Praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter the Praetorium, so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Now, they've already had the beginning Passover meal that happened on Thursday night. But you have to remember, the Passover season was a seven-day festival. And so they could not be defiled. They could not go into any Gentile's house. They could not go into any Gentile government building. They could not do anything because that would defile them. Then the process of getting cleansed so that you could take the Passover meal lasted longer than the Passover lasted, so they didn't want to go in. So they stand outside the praetorium, which is the palace of Pilate. Uh, there was also one of these palaces up in Caesarea. It's where, palace, it's where Pilate's living. So they take him. They're not going to go in there because if they go in there, they're going to be unclean. So they stand outside. So Pilate is going to have to come outside. Well, by, John does not tell us anything about what's going on while he's talking about Jesus being taken to Praetorium. While Jesus is being taken over to Pilate's palace, Judas is over at the Sanhedrin doing what he's going to do. He's remorseful. He knows he has committed a sin. 
And he goes back to those high priests, and he takes that bag of 30 pieces of silver, and he tries to give it back to them. They will not accept it, so he throws it into their area, and he goes away. And, of course, when he goes away, he goes and hangs himself. He has died and is dead of his own hand by hanging himself before Jesus is put on the cross. John doesn't tell us about that. Matthew and Luke, Matthew and Luke tell us about that because Matthew and Saul probably saw it happen and knew what happened. John goes on over to Pilate, and by this time Matthew has caught up, and Saul of Tarsus has caught up, so we have Luke's account. It says, Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, He had to come out. He had to come out on the front steps to step, talk to these Jews, because they're not coming on that Gentile property. He says, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to him, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. They want the death penalty, but they can't do it because Caesar has taken that authority away from them. And that was, verse 32, to fulfill the words of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore Pilate uh, entered again into the praetorium, and he summoned Jesus and said to him, get this, he goes back inside, he's thinking, what am I going to do? I've got these Jews sitting outside on the steps, they want me to do something with this Jesus. Would you guys go get Jesus and bring him? Now Jesus, he doesn't care where he goes, it all belongs to him anyway, you understand? I mean, it all belongs to him. Jesus walks up the steps of that Gentile place. He's not going to do anything else. He knows what the plan is. He's not worried about being defiled. Actually, he's a spotless lamb of God. He walks up the steps. He goes into the praetorium. And Pilate, inside the praetorium, or the palace of Pilate, Pilate turns to him, and here's what he says. He says, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you saying on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Pilate's a pretty level-headed guy. He just wants to know. What have you done? What in the world have you done to infuriate these people, to bring them to you, to me, bring you to me, at this time early in the morning? <laughs> Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Well, that's pretty sen sensible. Of course, everything Jesus says is sensible. Pilate's thinking, okay, he's not a threat to me. He's not a threat to Caesar. He may be a little Looney Tunes and think that he's got a kingdom somewhere up there in the sky or wherever, some, in some other realm. But, pff, you know, we got these kind of guys running all around here. We can't be putting all these things, to guys, to death. Pilate's not concerned about this. He sees nothing. And it's a very truthful sta statement. If Jesus was to take over the kingdom, his disciples would have their swords and clubs, and they would be out there fighting for Jesus to be the king. But they're not doing that. And Pilate understands that. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Because the way he's holding themselves, the way he's talking about things, he is a king. And Jesus answers, says, you, you, you say correctly that I am a king. And for this reason I have been born, and for this I have come to the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus is talking about truth. Pilate's wondering about truth. Just really wondering, you know, what is truth? What's going on? Actually, when you get over to the other documents that we have, the other Gospels, we'll find out that Pilate's going to come back to that idea of truth. And some other couple of things, or other, couple of things are going to transpire. Um, Pilate now is going to decide that he doesn't have to do anything with Jesus. So he sends him over to Herod. John doesn't tell us anything about Jesus being sent to Herod. John doesn't tell us anything about Herod's soldiers mocking Jesus. He doesn't tell us about Herod sending Jesus back to Pilate. Because remember, Herod can't put this man to death. He's got to go because Herod is a Jewish king. He's got to go back to Pilate, who's got the authority to put Jesus to death. So he ends up back with Pilate, 
and the topic of truth is coming back up. And Pilate then says to him, he's already gone over to see Herod, and he's back with Pilate now. Pilate says to him, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? And so they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Now, if you go read the other places, Pilate actually gives them that option. Would you like for me to release this man to you? Or would you like for me to release Barabbas? Pilate is playing a card here. He's trying to deal out a better deal for Jesus. He finds no guilt in Jesus. He wants to release Jesus because Jesus has done nothing that, that he is guilty of, that they're guilty of doing, Pilate sees, and he's trying to get Jesus released. So Pilate has picked the very worst of the worst criminals who is in their prison, and that is Barabbas. Barabbas is an evil man. He has been evil to the Jews, even though he's a Jew. He's been evil to the Gentiles, even though he's a Gentile. I mean, he's a Jew. He's evil to everybody. He is a murderer. And they have gotten him and put him in jail. And what Pilate is trying to do is to offer a substitute for Jesus, which was the custom to let somebody go out of prison during the time of Passover, get a free release and he wanted to offer, so he offered them the worst of the worst, thinking that the Jews would pick Jesus over this horrible, sinful uh, murderer named Barabbas. But Pilate's uh, um, plan backfires on him. And they said, no, release Barabbas to us. They want Jesus to die, not Barabbas. So Barabbas gets released. So Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and a purple robe on him, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. They're beating him. They've put this crown of thorns on him. Blood's coming down his face, and, Je and, and Pilate has allowed them to scourge him, to beat him with the cat of nine tails. That's against the law. Because Pilate has not given a verdict or a punishment to him yet. He has found nothing wrong with him, and he has done this to a, a Roman citizen who you can't do that to a Roman citizen until there is a verdict and then a punishment on two separate days. So Pilate's broken the law here. But Jesus endures it. So Pilate then, after he scourged Jesus, he goes out to the to the steps of the praetorium of the palace, and he says to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. If he found no guilt in him, why in the world does he have a crown of thorns on, blood coming down his face, and he's been beat with a cat of nine tails, and they've slapped him all over his face, and his face is blue. Why? He's coming out and saying, Isn't this punishment enough? I'm going to release him, because I find no guilt in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns, in the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Pilate is trying to release Jesus. He does not want to put Jesus to death. But Jesus has already said, it is for this purpose that I am here in this place because he has to die for the sins of the world. And Pilate's a part of the plan, and Pilate is trying to bail out of that plan. He didn't want to be a part of it. The Jews answered and said, we have a law. And by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. That, there's the accusation. Okay, there's the accusation now. That he claims to be God, and because of that, he ought to die. He claims to be bigger than Caesar, and he ought to die. He ought to be a, this ought to be a problem. So Pilate, and John tells us about this only, so therefore Pilate heard this statement. He was even more afraid, and he has every right to be afraid. So he goes back into the palace. So he's going out to the steps because they won't come in. And he's going back in, he's going back out, he's going back in, going back out. He brings Jesus back in. He says, I've got a question for you. Where are you from? Where are you from? And Jesus answered and gave him no answer. And Pilate says, do you not understand? Do you not speak to me? Do you not know or not understand that I have the authority to release you? And I have the authority to crucify you? 
Jesus answered and said, You have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Those guys out there on the steps got the greater sin. But he's got to be there. He has to be there. This is important. The authority from God and from above is for Pilate to put Jesus to death. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. You catch it again? Third time. He doesn't want to put Jesus to death. He's afraid. But the Jews cried out saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. This is the reason why Paul got, got beat over in Philippi. This is the reason why Paul got beaten, thrown in jail in Thessalonica. This is why Paul got beaten, put in jail in, in Berea. Actually, he escaped from there before they put him into jail. Because anyone who claims to be a king is a threat to Caesar. And if Pilate let's Jesus go, and he does something to overthrow Caesar, Pilate's, it's Pilate's responsibility for letting him go. So now they've got Pilate between a rock and a hard place. If he lets Jesus go, the people will hate him. If Jesus is let go, and he does something to overthrow Caesar, but he doesn't win and they kill Jesus, they'll come after Pilate and get his head. Pilate's in a no-win situation. He wants to release Jesus. And he has reasons to be afraid. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out. Here we go back again, outside. And he finally goes out and he sits in the judgment seat. He sits on that place called the pavement. In Hebrew, it's called the Gabbatha. And there, uh, and there he sits to pass judgment. Here's what he says. And now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. Now, the Passover had happened the night before, but now they've got to prepare for the Sabbath that occurs every time there's the Passover week. They've got to prepare the food for today, and they've got to prepare it for today for tomorrow because they can't do work on the Sabbath. So he brings them out. It's about the sixth hour. In fact, it's a little after six o'clock in the morning. And he says to the Jews, Behold your king." So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. John doesn't tell us about Pilate going over, taking water, pouring it into the basin, washing his hands, drying them off, throwing the towel down to say, I'm not part of this, but you take him and you crucify him. That's going to get Pilate in a heap of mess. Because in just three years from this date, Tiberius Caesar, who's the Caesar, <clears throat> is going to be ill. And according to Roman records, he sends to Pilate to bring that healer named Yeshua, to him immediately to heal him. Pilate is afraid and sends a note back that says he has been put to death. Tiberius Caesar then calls for Pilate to come to Rome. Pilate goes to Rome. He takes the tunic that was wrapped around Jesus in his burial with him and wraps it around his neck and goes in to see Tiberius. Tiberius is very cordial to him when Pilate is there, but when Pilate leaves, Tiberius becomes very agitated, according to the records. He calls for Pilate to come back. He's very cordial to Pilate in, in his front of, when he's in front of him, but when Pilate leaves, he's very agitated, and he says, I am going to have Pilate put to a shameful death. Pilate hears of that, threat on his life. It's from the Caesar. So he takes a table knife, and he kills himself. When Tiberius hears of Pilate's death, he says, surely Pilate died a shameful death. Because to a Roman, the only time you took your life by suicide would, it would be honorable is when you were in war so that you would not be taken captive. Any other suicide was shameful. And Pilate has died a shameful death. They take that tunic 
and they wrap Pilate in it and try to throw, throw him into the river to dispose of the body, and his body keeps floating. They finally take Pilate down, and they are able to dispose of him down in another little town called Turin. And that is where the cloth is left, according to the Roman records. Now, I know that we have a shroud of Turin that has Jesus on it today. Whether that's the same shroud or not, we do not know. Do not even make that conjecture. It's just interesting that that is where, first of all, that's where the shroud gets its name because of the shroud of Jesus being taken to Rome by, by Pilate and being in, ending up in Turin. That's how all that's being put together. Probably not a lot of truth to it, okay? But that's what happens, and that is the shroud. Because Pilate is close enough to the scenario to take the shroud that Jesus was buried in and wrap it around his neck. John then does not say anything about Jesus carrying his own cross for a short distance. Does it say anything about Simon of Serene being ordered into service to carry Jesus' cross because Jesus has been beaten so bad to, 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 to Calvary? And Jesus, uh, John doesn't speak about the women who are crying as they watch. John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all pick up in their Gospels, and they says, they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is, a, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. None of the Gospels tell us about the other two men, but you know what? They were carrying their cross, too, in the same streets guarded by the same thousand soldiers that were guarding Jesus because it was a cohort of soldiers, according to Mark, that led Jesus to Calvary and guarded him until he was dead. A thousand soldiers, that's what a cohort is. John does not tell us about much of this stuff. John is probably off somewhere else. He's going to tend to Jesus' mother Mary to tell her what's going on because he's going to bring Mary to the cross. And Jesus is going to look off in next week's lesson. He's going to look off the cross down to John and say, John, take care of Mary, and John will take care of Mary until she dies. So John doesn't tell us about all this other stuff. He just knows that he was led off. Neither does John tell us about the soldiers trying to give Jesus some wine mixed with some gall, with some pain medicine to dull the pain, and Jesus won't take it. None of that's mentioned in John because John's not there. He's taking care of Jesus' mother. But they'll finally arrive as Jesus is on the cross and we'll be speaking to them as we pick that up next time we're together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that these men have recorded for us the facts that happened with you. May we learn our lessons that we not speak in the quiet of the back rooms, but we are like you and that we will always say what we have to say out in public. And the things that we would say in private, we will also say them in public and we will never say anything in private that we wouldn't say in public. Now we understand that there's a time for the things to happen according to your plan and we thank you that you were willing to take that cup and die for us because our salvation is tied up in you. And we're blessed because of you. We thank you for all you've done for us. Oh, how we love you. Oh, how we adore you. Oh, how we long to see you face to face and feel the touch of your hands on, a, on ours and leave all the toils and struggle of this world behind. Lord, as we worship you, we ask for you to bless us. In your son's name, amen.